All right, guys, well, welcome to chapter two. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to talk about intelligent agents. We're going to develop the idea of intelligent agents a little bit further. And uh, we're going to have to describe a few things um, about intelligent agents. First of all, what, what makes it intelligent, right? So we want to develop maybe a little bit better definition of intelligence based off of rationality. And I gave you a little bit of a preview of it in the previous chapter, but we're going to dig into a little bit more um, now in this chapter. And we also have to talk a little bit about um, the environment which an agent uh, operates in, right? And how that environment can manifest itself. And then we're going to talk about at a very high level in the abstract using pseudocode and pictures, okay? Um, different types of architectures for agents, okay? We're also going to throw some definitions at you, but this chapter is talking at a very, very high level conceptually, right? We want to be able to conceptualize what an agent is, can conceptualize um, what an environment is that it might operate in. Okay, we have to have this terminology to be able to discuss, you know, making something intelligent or to be able to discuss, um, you know, the different tools, I guess you could say, the different um, entities that we're going to be involved with discussing um, the rest of the way. Okay, so um, probably the most confusing part about this chapter is just going to be some of the terminologies, intelligent agent, agent function, actuators, perceptors. You know, P's, what's an environment, stochastic versus deterministic, that kind of stuff. So what you'll want to do is really take your time in this chapter. And, you know, if you have to, read the chapter a few times. This is one of those chapters where it's a pretty easy read, I think, compared to some of the later chapters, which get heavy into it. So I'm going to go through, use the slides here. I won't go into as much depth as the textbook does. I think I'll give you a, a pretty good overview. But I'd really encourage you to read the chapter, um, you know, maybe after you see this video, um, just to just to get a better idea, you know, just to really solidify in your head. Because the rest of the course, we're going to be talking about agent functions and environments, and um, you know, in the context of other or of a bunch of different algorithms or or applying different types of logic to these things, right? So it's important that you understand, you know, what an agent is and the different uh, environments that it can that it can operate in. Okay, and what it means to be intelligent. Okay, so first things first. Uh, section two point one is agents and environments. So a definition or some definitions for you. Very 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 important. Okay, so an agent is anything that can be viewed as perceiving its environment through sensors and acting upon that environment through actuators, right? So this is a different definition or maybe a little bit more precise definition than what we saw in the previous chapter. So an agent is anything that within a particular environment can look around and perceive the environment, right? Or maybe, maybe there's a lot of different ways you can perceive your environment. I mean, one could be through maybe temperature, touch, visually, um, you know, by smelling your environment, whatever. An agent is anything that can perceive attributes or characteristics of its environment, right? Through the use of sensors, and what are some examples of sensors? I'm a human being, my eyes are sensors, my nose, sensors, sense of taste, sensors, right? Touch, sensors, okay? And then acting upon that environment, moving through that environment, manipulating in that environment through actuators, okay? So what are my actuators? All right, my feet, okay, are actuators on a car, tires, right? Uh, maybe even brakes for slowing the car down. Um, so an agent, anything that can be viewed as perceiving its environment through sensors and acting upon its environment through actuators. All right, so next definition, a percept, a percept, right? So those sensors are gonna have certain inputs, right? There's gonna be things that you perceive about your environment or that the agent perceives about its environment. Now, if you could boil down to everything that you perceive in your environment to um, discrete items or entities or things, then those discrete entities or items or things would be a percept, okay? So anything that 
a agent can perceive is a percept. Okay, a percept. So what's a percept sequence? Well, what's a sequence? It's a bunch of things, right? It's a bunch of things in a row, right? Or, or one after the other, ordered. Okay, well, a percept sequence is a history of everything that the agent has ever perceived throughout its existence, right? So if you could remember every single thing that you saw from birth, right? That would be your percept sequence. Here, that would be an example of a percept sequence. Okay, so anything you can perceive, percept. The history of all things perceived, percept sequence. Okay, sensors, something that an agent uses to perceive its environment, to absorb the percepts. Actuators, what are those? Those are things that an agent uses to manipulate its environment. Okay, now. The uh, intelligent agents that we have, or agents that we create that are hopefully intelligent, they are going to be able to make decisions about what they should do based on the percepts that they receive, okay? Now, if you can specify all the possible actions, all the possible choices that a um, agent can make, right, based off of certain percepts or percept sequences, then you've said how that agent is gonna do its thing. Right, so um, an agent, imagine all the different combinations of percepts that could have, of things that could perceive in a set amount of time, okay? For every combination of percepts that that agent could ever perceive, if you can map that to a decision, right? Then you have defined how that agent is gonna work, how it's gonna do its things. In mathematical terms, textbook mentions that you can say that that specification, that mapping of percepts to actions or percept sequence to actions, that is the agent function. Okay, we're talking very abstract mathematical language here, right? Just a mapping of percepts to actions. Okay, I perceive A, B, and C. That percept sequence leads me to do G, okay? You slap me across the face, you punch me in the nose, and you make fun of my mother. Those are three percepts. What's my action? Me kicking you in the head, <laughs> right? So that's a mapping of a percept sequence to an action, okay? Now, if you can map every single thing I could possibly perceive to some action that I would take, you've defined what my behavior is, okay? And that mapping is the agent function. Now, when you create an agent program, right, what you've done is you've um, implemented that agent function. You've coded that mapping, right, in, in some computer programming language, say, right, C++, Python, whatever, okay? So figure 2.1 gives you an idea of this in a, like I said, in, in, in the abstract at a very high level. So you've got an agent, right? Now, what makes up an agent? Sensors, actuators, and that function program, okay? And that function program being an implementation of the agent function. What's the agent function? A mapping of percepts to actions, okay? So an agent senses its environment through sensors, each thing that you can sense in your environment is an individual percept, and your actuators are something that causes you to manipulate or act within your environment through certain kinds of actions, right? Um, I perceive ice cream, okay? So I sense the ice cream with my eyes. I perceived it, that was one percept. My agent function, that's implemented through my internal code in my brain, says, you know, I map the ice cream percept to put it in my face, right? Stuff my mouth with it. So my actuators, hands, mouth, nom, 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 nom. I manipulated my environment. The ice cream was in the, in the environment, okay? Now, if I reprogrammed myself, say I'm on a diet, then that action uh, that was mapped to me perceiving the ice cream might be to pick the ice cream up and throw it away, okay? And it was my agent function or my agent program, which is an implementation of the function, that said, no, you saw the ice cream 
and then the action that's mapped to that is throw it away. All right, so here's a toy problem, a so-called toy problem, because toy problems are just little problems that you can use for simple examples in an academic setting to help um, explain concepts, okay? So vacuum cleaner world is the toy problem that uh, the text brings up. And um, in the vacuum cleaner world, it's, it's a simple environment, right? You've got a vacuum cleaner and the world consists of two spaces. The environment is two spaces. Each individual space leveled A or B can be either dirty or clean, okay? And the vacuum cleaner can be either in space A or space B. The reason I'm going through this is because the text re refers back to this example over and over and over again, okay? Now, the vacuum cleaner can perform, uh, I think it's one of three actions. Move right, move left, and suck, okay? Uh, what can it perceive? It can perceive um, what square it's in and whether that square is clean or dirty, okay? So this right here, figure two, three, is a partial, not complete, right? Because there's not enough space on the page or in the on the slide to show every possible percept sequence that could exist. But this just gives you an idea. Matter of fact, you could, on your uh, next homework assignment, you could base your homework assignment off of something like this. And so what this is, is a tabular format or um, a tabular description of the agent function. Okay, so in this column here, you see um, a list of percept sequences, okay? And each percept sequence is mapped to an action. That's what this right column is for. So this percept sequence here, this is A is a percept, clean is a percept. So together, that's the entire percept sequence. Now, what is that percept sequence? Well, I'm in square A. This is the vacuum perceiving its environment. I'm in square A and it's clean, okay? So for that percept sequence, I have to map that to an action that I'm gonna take. Okay, so what's the action? Move right, okay? Um, here's another percept sequence. I'm in square A and it's dirty. Let's map that to an action. Suck, right? So if I'm in square A and it's a dirty, dirty square, I'm gonna suck, okay? Um, another percept sequence. I'm in square B, it's clean, so what am I gonna do? What's the action? What's the mapping? Move left, okay, and, and so on, right? So. Um, this is just a partial table and percept sequences can be incredibly long, right? So that's another reason why, um, you know, you don't have, you know, this, a complete table. Because this thing can just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, and grow, and grow right? Um, especially as the environment's changing, because you can imagine in a world where there's a vacuum cleaner, you know, as time goes by, um, you know, a square will get dirty, some dust will settle or whatever. Okay. So we'll come back to that, that idea over and over again. So section 2.2, good behavior, the concept of rationality. So what we have to do is we have to talk about what is intelligence, right? What is rational behavior and how can you judge that, okay? So here's a definition for you. A rational agent is one that does the right thing, right? Um, so what does that mean, okay? So, you know, you got that, that table that we just looked at. That was a mapping of percepts to actions, okay? So for every possible percept and for every action, okay, that mapping, what you perceive and what you should do in response, it's correct, right? It has the desired outcome or the desired mapping. If I see that the square is dirty, that's one percept, and the action is suck, then that's correct for what we want this agent to do, right? What would be incorrect for that entry in that table would be, you know, based on what I want the agent to do as the designer, right? Would be to say, oh, well, dirty square, um, move right, right? That's, 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 that's not the right thing. The right thing in this context, in my opinion as the designer, is that it should suck up the dirt, right? So what is the right thing? What did I just do? I considered the consequences, right? So I wanted, if it was a dirty square, for it to be clean, right? I want the sucking action to happen so it's clean. So start with the end in mind and that can help you determine what the right thing is gonna be for that agent. So a rational agent is one that does the right thing. 
what it's supposed to do. Okay, so there's a chain of um, events, I guess you could say, right? You know, an agent perceives its environment, right? So an agent has percepts, right? It says precepts there, but it should be percepts as a typo. Um, those percepts lead to sequences of actions, right? And those action sequences lead to changes in your environment. Okay, I perceive, or my, my agent, my vacuum cleaner perceives it's in a dirty square. That's mapped to a particular action. That action is suck. So the result of that sucking is that my environment changed. The square is now clean. Okay. Now, if the sequence of states, okay, that changes that environment is what you want, then the agent did its job. Now, what do I mean by sequence of states? Right? Well, one state of vacuum world is um, vacuum in A, um, square dirty, right? Um, square A dirty, square B clean. That's one state, okay? Now, once the vacuum had perceived the environment, that percept it was an A, dirty, um, performs the action, suck. We had a state transition. The state has been has been updated. The environment has changed. We've created a second state. Okay, so we went from a dirty vacuum in A to that was one state to a second state, a clean vacuum A, right? So those are two separate states. Now, if you get a sequence of those states, okay, that changes the environment. And that change the environment is desirable, is good, is what you want. And the agent did its job. Imagine another scenario where um, the vacuum is in square A and square A is clean, square B is dirty, right? Well, the mapping, the agent function says that if the vacuum is in A and A is clean, move right, okay? So that initial state, vacuum A, A clean, be dirty after we've moved the uh, agent the vacuum cleaner to square B that's a second state the second state is a clean B dirty vacuum in B right so then the vacuum perceives that it's in a dirty square so what's its action suck once that actions completed right that's two states in the sequence we've now entered a third state so what's that third state a clean, B clean, vacuum in B, right? So that's three, a sequence of three states. That sequence led to an environment that was desirable. We wanted a clean floor. The agent did its job. Thumbs up. Good job, agent. Okay, and if I lost it there by waving fingers at you, you know, rewind. Just, you know, listen through again. And if you have any questions, give me a holler, okay? Now, you can measure the performance of an agent, okay, whether it's a vacuum cleaner, whether it's a self-driving car, whether it's the AI in a video game, okay, using a metric, okay, and the metric has a name, the textbook refers to it as a performance measure, okay. Now, could be the case that one performance measure is enough for you to be able to evaluate whether the agent did its job, okay, but it also might be the case that you might need multiple performance measures, you might need more than one, okay? All right, so when um, designing a performance measure, I mean, what you're doing, what you're doing is, is you got an agent and you're scoring its behavior, right? You're, you're assigning it a score, right? You did this action, that was good, plus one to you, right? You did this action, that was good, plus 10 to you. You know, agent, I'm evaluating you. Every single time you do something right, plus one, plus 10, plus 20. You do something bad, minus 100, okay? So every time it takes an action, you can score it. And that's, that's what we're talking about, a performance measure. Okay, so how do you design that? Okay, think about the end in mind. Okay, think about how you want the environment to change. Plus one for a clean square, right? Uh, minus one for moving left, okay? Uh, depending on what the goal is, how you want the agent to behave. So this is kind of a way, by, by using that performance metric, for that performance measure, you can kind of guide the overall behavior of an intelligent agent. 
by um, having it learn which uh, sequence of states and therefore which sequence of actions that modify the environment to, to go through all those states gives you the best score. Okay, so you know, what are you gonna what are you gonna do? Um, so are you just gonna judge? Here's an example, right? So for that vacuum, are you gonna build the performance measure around just whether or not the floor is clean? Well, then you'd have a particular scoring system for that, right? How about how efficiently it cleans the floor? Maybe the fewest number of actions. Okay, well you might have a different scoring system for that. So your goal, what, how you want the environment to change, right? Or how you want to move through states of the environment is what you're aiming for here. Maybe the amount that the, um, that the vacuum cleans, right? Maybe you give it a plus one for every dirty square that it cleans, right? So, I mean, it's just, it depends. That's what I'm trying to say. It depends, right? It's, it's, it depends on the problem that you're trying to solve, okay? There is no one size fits all. Okay, so rationality. Okay, so what is rational? What's rational behavior for an, uh, for an agent? Well, it depends. It depends on um, a lot of different things. Okay, so whether or not you can say that an agent has been rational or acted rational is gonna be based off of your performance measure, right? What the agent knew before it started to do its thing, right? Um, the type of actions that an agent can pursue, what kind of choices are up to it. Okay, these are all things that kind of help define, well, was our agent rational? Okay, and the agent's current percept sequence, what it's perceived up to this point, right? So you've got some kind of performance measure that's about evaluating the behavior of the agent, right? Some kind of scoring system. And so then based off of that scoring system, you can look at an agent and say, okay, well, what did you know before I told you before I told you to get started, what did you know beforehand? Okay, um, so that's one thing. Um, what can you do? What choices are open to you? And what did you know up to this point? Or what have you experienced so far? All right. so these are all factors that play into whether or not you can evaluate an agent as being rational or not. So, considering these factors, here's a definition from the text for you, page 37. I'm just gonna read it you know, word for word because I can't think of a better way to put this. Um, for each possible percept sequence, this is just all kind of summarizing it all in a more concise way of what I just said, okay? For each possible percept sequence, a rational agent should select an action that is expected to maximize its performance measure given the evidence provided by the percept sequence and whatever built-in knowledge the agent has, okay? Maximize the performance measure given the evidence provided by the percept sequence and whatever built-in knowledge the agent has. Okay, in one definition, for every single possible, for every possible percept sequence. So here's a concise definition of what we were just talking about, right? This is a definition, a definition for rationality given by the text. Okay, so here's an example, performance measure. Okay, um, when the vacuum cleaner's done, you can say, all right, one point per clean square, okay, and with a maximum of a thousand actions taken to get uh, that number of clean squares, because it could be the case that depending on how you program the vacuum cleaner, you could end up in an infinite loop, right? So you can make sure that an infinite loop doesn't happen by saying, okay, you you can you can we're going to score you, but you only get a thousand chances to get this right. You're, you're putting in a hard turn limit, as it were. Okay. Uh, let's see here. The environment is known without, you know, you know that what square you're in. Um, and you know that there's two squares, one's A and B. Now, you don't know if something's dirty or not. And you know, this is all the prior knowledge, okay? You know that a, uh, a clean square will stay clean. And you know that um, performance sucking action cleans the square, right? So this is that prior knowledge we were just talking about. What are your possible actions? Okay, um, left, right, and suck. Right. So, what can the agent know about its environment? What can it perceive? It has sensors to allow it to know what location it's in, and whether the square is clean or dirty. Okay. Now, according to this performance measure, okay, 
will say, yeah, this is rational. Okay, we laid out a we laid out a performance measure, and according to this performance measure, it's it's rational. Okay, it does what it's supposed to do, given it tries to maximize its score, given what it knows, what its actions are, and what it can perceive. Okay. Um, now, what if you can change it though to make it to where maybe it's not so rational, right? Or try to eliminate some irrational behavior. What if you give a penalty, right? Um, for taking for taking actions, let's say you do minus one for every action that you take. Well, once the dirt is cleaned up, right? It oscillates. Because remember that that table that we looked at. Um, for the agent function said, all right, well, if you're in a clean square, move right. Or if you're, if you're in square A, if you're in square B, move left, right? Um, so it's just bouncing back and forth. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. Now, according to this measure, you can take up to a thousand actions and okay, fine. Um, you get your, your two points, right? Because you got one for each square. Okay. For each clean square. But now if you subtract a point for every action and it starts and it starts os oscillating, right? We changed how we're scoring. In the previous example, we were just scoring for clean squares. Two points, you got two clean squares, awesome. Right, but now if it's just bouncing back and forth, minus one, 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 up to a thousand actions, even if after it's cleaned the score, its performance measure is now negative nine, nine, eight, right? Which is a lot worse than two, okay? So how can you make it more rational? How can you make it behave better? Well, once the floor is clean, once you've detected to, you know, that A is clean and B is clean, and you can detect the squares being clean. We have to introduce an element of memory, but you can detect it when both squares are clean. If you remember that A is clean and then you, then you discover that B is clean, shut down, turn yourself off, it's over. Right? So you minimize the penalties that you take in your performance measure. All right. So agents are not omniscient. They don't know all things all the time, right? So they can't know in advance what the outcome is going to be. They can't predict the future. Okay. Um, so what, what does that mean? Why, well, how does that impact us? Well, a rational action isn't always going to be perfect, right? Choices that you make may be perfectly rational that lead to horrendous outcomes, right? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right? It might have been the right choice at the time. It was logical to do A, right? And you couldn't see that by doing doing A, that ended you to the, that ended up taking you down to a horrible outcome, right? Well, I told her I loved her, and then 20 years from now, you ended up in divorce and custody battles when your life's miserable or something, right? At the time, everything seemed great, but then you couldn't see 20 years down the road that it was going to turn out so horribly, right? Was it irrational for you to get married to that person? Not at the time, right? So it was a rational action to do that thing based on your performance metric that you had. You know, maybe you were maybe plus 1,000 points for getting married or whatever. I think, I don't know, maybe the Sims or something. Um, so actions, even though, you know, they're irrational actions, they're not always perfect, right? And they don't always lead to the best outcome. Right? But at the time, they were the right choice. So rationality, we're trying to, determine, to define rationality in here. Rationality, an agent that is rational, is going to maximize its expected performance. Okay? The good that it expects to accomplish by any particular action, by any particular choice. Okay? Expected, but you don't know for sure that you're going you're gonna to get the best result, right? Because you can't know. Now, perfection is not rationality, okay? Perfection is maximizing your actual performance. You know, you made a choice and it always worked out perfect every single time. How many of us can claim that? Not me, right? So you can have a rational agent. You can design a rational agent, absolutely. Can you design a perfect agent? No way, can't be done. Okay, now that being said, you can hard code in, right? You can you can design an agent that avoids just obviously patently stupid actions, right? So if you had a robot that was going to cross the street, right? It doesn't have to go into a street and then perceive getting hit. 
to, to, to say, oh, that was a bad choice, right? Um, or to discover that it made a mistake. You can have that robot look both ways first, right? And not just walk in the middle of the street, okay? Now, it's not a guarantee that, you know, the, the robot looks left, looks right, and then walks in the street. It's not a guarantee that a meteor isn't gonna fly out of the sky and smash the robot, right? Once it looked left, once it looked right and saw no traffic, it was perfectly rational to make the decision to move into the street, right? That was that was trying to maximize the best outcome, right? Or trying to come up with the best outcome. Okay, but it wasn't perfect because the meteor smashed the robot. It didn't know that was gonna happen. Can't tell the future. Okay, so actions that are attempting to modify future percepts as that example, it's known as information gathering. Oh, I have to look that way. Oh, I have to look that way. All right, well, that's going to modify, hopefully, what I'm going to perceive here in a second. I'm going to perceive, once I move into the street, that I was safe. Okay, by looking left, looking right, I'm, I'm trying to modify the future. I'm trying to make the future safer. Okay? The other example would be if you wanted um, to have a vacuum cleaner that you know, explored the entire floor first and noted where all the dirty spots were. And then once it learned that, then it went straight to each dirty spot and just cleaned those rather than just running the cleaner across the entire floor, right? So a rational agent can gather information or should gather information. Well, the, I mean, it depends, but they can gather information and they learn from it. They make modified choices based off of information that they learn, okay? Their choices can be modified based off of that. All right, um, so let's talk about autonomy um, agents that can't learn if they, they can't make decisions on their own if all of their knowledge about the universe is pre-programmed into them right um, they're not autonomous okay they're depending purely on my knowledge you know, if I'm designing the agent they're, 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 if they're if they're only ever doing what I say is possible right and I'm spelling out every single choice everything they'll ever know and you can say that an agent, to a certain extent, lacks autonomy. Okay, so rational agents should be, ideally, designed to be autonomous. What does that mean? It means, well, they gotta start somewhere. I mean, I have, I'm the designer. I have to start off some fundamental axioms. You know, I gotta program do it, some fundamental assumptions, axioms, whatever. But, you know, and I can say, okay, here's how you get started, right? Working in your environment. But after that, the agent should be able to learn and then act on its own. Okay. It shouldn't always just depend on knowledge I put in. I shouldn't, I should, it shouldn't have to have me reprogram it for every new situation it encounters. Right? That's ideal. Okay. The more complex agents anyway. All right, anyway, so that's a little bit about rationality. That's a little bit about defining what an agent is, percepts, all that kind of stuff. So let's talk a little bit about environments. Okay. So definition of an agent. Now let's talk about how we can describe um, environments that that agent is going to be performing in, right? Let me try to speed this, uh, uh, speed this up a little bit. Okay, so you're going to try to build an agent that's rational. So you have to consider the environment in which it's going to perform or that's going to act, okay? So that's often referred to or the textbook refers to it as a task environment. And they come up with this, um, what, anagram, I guess you could say? I think that's the term for this. Um, abbreviations, P-E-A-S, P's. P's, what's it stand for? Performance, environment, actuators, and sensors. Okay, so when you're gonna design an agent, you have to design an agent to work within a particular environment. And so these are four things that you have to describe for that agent. You know, you have to come up with a performance measure. You have to de define the environment which it's gonna behave or that's gonna act. You have to define what type of actuators it has, how it can um, manipulate that environment or act within the environment. And then what sensors, you have to specify what sensors that that agent's gonna have, how it can perceive its environment, which is then gonna define what type of percepts it can have. And then um, the, once you define the actuators, you know, that tells you uh, what kind of choices it can make, okay? Um, so you, you have to be able to evaluate those choices based off the performance. And then the types of choices, or the types of choices you can make are, are gonna be determined by your environment, the types of actuators and sensors you're gonna need. So it's all kind of intermingled, right? It's all kind of related. Okay, so the task environment is made up of P's. Just remember P's, who doesn't like P's, right? P's are good. 
All right. So think about a rational agent, automated taxi driver. Yeah, self-driving car. Okay. So that's the agent type, taxi driver. So this right here, you know, keep this in mind. File away. Put in your brain. You know, make a note to yourself. For your homework assignment, you're going to be describing a rational agent, right? You're going to be talking about its task environment. Okay. I'm going to give you a brief description of some of the things that, that the agent can do in the homework assignment. And then you're going to have to de design the agent and you're going to have to describe its environment. And by design the agent, I mean set up its, um, its agent function. Okay. But anyway, so taxi driver, what's the performance measure? Well, in general terms, you know, we can say, well, a good performance by this agent is going to be one in which the agent safe gets the person there fast. It obeys traffic laws. You know, the passenger isn't freaked out and you want the trip to be as profitable as possible. Okay. So the more of these things are hit um, by the agent, the more of it he's successful at, the higher the performance, the better the performance. What's, what are some attributes that the environment it behaves in? Well, there's the road it drives on. There's other cars. Okay. There are pedestrians. Usually you want to avoid those, right? And then there's the customers that are hopping on to the car, right? So those are, those, there, there could be other things too. I mean, you can think of a lot of different things to describe this environment, but those are some examples. Actuators, car has to steer, so the agent has to be able to move the steering wheel. Accelerator has to be able to speed the car up, brake, slow it down. Signals, turn left, turn right. I know if you drive a BMW, those are probably optional for you. Um, you know, hit the horn, um, you know, that sort of stuff, right? So what are some things that you could use for this agent in terms of sensors? Well, cameras, right? To, to see how far something in front of you is. Um, sonar, I guess, um, you know, use some kind of echolocation. You need a speedometer to sense how fast you are. You can use GPS to know what location you're at and when the um, taxi has reached its destination. You know, odometer, how, um, uh, how many miles you've gone, you know, that sort of stuff, okay? Keyboard for the customer to interact with um, the taxi driver, okay? All right, so environments can be real or virtual. I'll give you a description right there of a real environment, but what about a virtual environment, right? You can have an agent that is an AI opponent in some game, right? Some bots, some bots that you're, you're, you're writing um, in a, for a first-person shooter or something, okay? So what matters here is how complex the environments are, um, especially in the context of what the agent has to do. Okay, now that percept sequence, you know, the, the, everything that the agent is going to see, okay, everything's going to perceive, every percept, right, that sequence is just a history of everything that it's seen or that it's perceived. That's generated from the environment. That stuff comes from the environment. Okay, and um, the measure of the performance within that uh, environment, you know, the agent, how it responds, the choices it makes, the performance measure, right? So you have to understand the environment so that way you can, that can help you guide uh, the behavior of the agent, okay? And how you're going to evaluate its performance and tailor its performance measure um, for that environment. Okay, so example, uh, parts assembly robot, very simple environment. Conveyor belt, part A, part B. It has to pick up one part, smush it together on another part, okay? On the other hand, like I was saying, AI bots, right? So for a first person shooter, or maybe some software that scans different Reddit feeds looking for stories you might be interested in, right? That's a lot more complex environment. That's much more complicated, okay? So here's some more examples for you um, in the same vein as uh, the taxi driver, right? So um, the part picking robot, right? So what's your performance measure here? Well, the percentage of parts in the correct bins, right? So maybe um, the robot has to pick a part off a conveyor belt. It's a sorting robot, put it into some bin or something, right? right? So what's in the environment? There's a conveyor belt that has parts on it. There's the bins it's supposed to sort them into. What are the actuators? It's got the arm and it's got the hand to grab the parts, right? Sensors, a camera to view the part, um, the joint angle to know, you know, if it's about to grab 
the park or you know if it's if it's extended far enough to drop it in the bin you know stuff like that so again more examples here of helping you to understand the task environment and again refer back to this for the homework assignment all right so what are some properties of task environments let's break this down a little bit further you know task environments anything in in, in the universe right um, could potentially and even in the either real universe or virtual universe could be a task environment now you can categorize them and describe them in useful ways using um, suitable language okay so let's take a look at what we're talking about here with these categories right so fully observable versus partially observable fully observable versus partially observable okay this will be useful for your homework assignment also okay so if an agent can sense all of the information in its environment to make a decision all of the time fully observable okay otherwise it's partially observable okay? if an agent can always access everything it needs all the time to make a decision it's fully observable otherwise if any part of that's not true it's partially observable now, if you've got an agent that has no sensors at all, right? Let's say that I was blind, deaf, lost my sense of smell and touch. You know, my environment to me, I'd be a brain in a vat, right? I, my, my environment would be unobservable. Single agent versus multi-agent, this should be pretty, pretty straightforward. You know, is the agent by itself or is it having to interact with other agents within its environment? So, if you're solving a crossword puzzle in that environment, it's a single agent environment. You know, if you've got cars driving, you know, on the same freeway, that's a multi-agent environment. You can have agents that work against each other and that, you know, two, two AIs playing chess, that's a competitive multi-agent environment. You can also have um, agents that are cooperative, right? You can have a cooperative multi-agent environment. Um, maybe Pac-Man, where the four ghosts are trying to get to Pac-Man, right? They're cooperating. They're not adversaries, right? So you can have communications between those agents be rational. And if it's co cooperative and they're trying to track you down and they're talking to each other, you know, letting them know each other's positions, that sort of thing, then that's an example of a cooperative environment that's definitely rational. Sometimes um, randomizing the behavior can be rational if you're in a competitive environment, right? Um, if you always know what the AI is gonna do every single time, right? If you're playing your first person shooter and you always know that that AI is gonna dodge left or dodge right, then it's gonna be an easy game to beat, right? Because you know the patterns. So introducing some randomization to make it less predictable, that's definitely a rational thing to do. Deterministic versus stochastic. So if you have a situation where the agent's in a state and it makes a decision and takes an action and the following state, the resulting state is purely only based off of uh, state plus action equals the new action, that's deterministic. In other words, there's no chance there. Okay? If there's no chance there, then it is deterministic. Okay. Um, otherwise, it's known as stochastic. So stochastic environment, stochasticism. I mean, you could say that it's basically an uncertain environment. It's, um, it is, there's a degree of chance in there, randomness that can play into it. So a dice roll, right? A, a game where the, that's, that's based partially on dice rolls, that's a stochastic environment, right? Whereas if I'm playing chess and I decide to move a piece from one square to another, the um, outcome of where the piece went to, that's purely deterministic, right? I didn't roll any dice there. I was in a particular state, I moved a piece, it's in a new state, okay? That is a deterministic environment. Okay, um, you can say that an environment is uncertain if it is not fully observable, or it is not deterministic, or it's not determined, uh, or if it's not fully observable and not deterministic, okay? Um, and by not deterministic, stochastic, okay? So um, in stochastic environments where there is uncertainty, the outcomes are based off of probabilities, right? So part of AI, 
you know, it was when we talked about the history of AI was introducing mathematics that led to probabilities, right? You have to make decisions off of what's the best chance for success, okay, in a lot of, in a lot of cases. Episodic versus sequential environments. Um, if it's an episodic environment, then the actions themselves are completely and utterly atomic, meaning that um, the agent does not consider any previous actions. It's just all it, all it sees is the state it's in right now, looks at the state and says, all right, I'm going to make a decision, which leads you to another state. Doesn't care about all of the history of states that led to this one. Previous moves in the game don't impact your decision whatsoever. That's episodic, okay? Sequential would say, oh, well, I did this move, he did that move, I did this move, he did that move, I did this move, he did that move, therefore, I'm gonna do this move, okay? So, you know, like, consider playing checkers, for example. Static versus dynamic. If an agent is trying to decide what to do, okay, and the environment can change while it's thinking, that's a dynamic environment, otherwise, it's static. Now, you can have a combination of the two called uh, semi-dynamic. So, for example, if the AI is trying to play a game of chess, right, and it's a timed game, right, while the AI is thinking, that timer's counting down. Timer's part of the environment. The environment's changing, right? So that is a semi-dynamic environment. Because the game itself, okay, is static until the move is made, but there's that, there's that dynamic part where the, the timer's changing. Discrete versus continuous, this has to do with time. Um, so chess, okay, uh, discrete. Okay, there's a finite number of turns, there's a finite number of states. You move from one state to the next. Okay, that's discrete. Um, whenever the moves get blurred, right, when time is continuous, like, you know, uh, the taxi driver driving, there's constantly things happening all the time. It's a lot harder to say, you know, to, to, to differentiate this turn from that turn. Everything is in constant motion, so it's continuous, okay? It's more like integers versus floating point numbers. You know, at one instance of time, the car speed is 82, and another it's 83, and another it's 41, right? Things are always moving. You're always kind of jiggling the wheel back and forth. You know, you're not thinking in terms of, you know, discrete, easily identifiable movements. You know, if you're riding a motorcycle, you're constantly making little minor adjustments, even subconsciously, right? It's not like, turn left, okay, now let me stop and think. Turn right. And when you're riding a motorcycle, you're always constantly doing a little bit of this, right, without even thinking about it. Known versus unknown. Okay, so this is talking about the um, agent's knowledge about uh, the environment it's operating in and the physics of that environment, right? So, you know, it's a known environment if the agent knows, um, you know, the probabilities of outcomes are given or of actions are given. So, you know, I, the agent knows I have a 77% chance of being successful uh, or this particular action happening if I make this choice. I have a 33% um, chance of being successful of this particular action happening if I take this choice right, or make this choice. You know, so that's, that's known. Um, if, if that's not the case, then it's an unknown environment. Now, known environments can be partially observable. Okay. So in a known environment, you know, all the rules, you know, the physics of the, of the world works. If I punch in the nose, it's going to hurt. Um, if, 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 um, the ball's coming at me and I block with the paddle. The ball's going to go off in a different direction. It's another example of a known environment. If I don't know what's going to happen to the ball when it hits my paddle, if I don't know what direction it's going to bounce off into, well, then that's a known and unknown, an unknown environment. Okay, and known environments can be partially observable. You know, you think about solitaire, right? Or you think about a poker game where the agent's playing. It doesn't know what cards somebody else has, but it knows all the rules of the game. It knows all the probabilities of um, what cards you have, what cards are left in the deck, uh, that sort of thing. All right, so um, now this is a really big point here, okay? It's, it's, it's that first point on the slide there. It's not always cut and dried, 
okay? You can argue one way or the other and sometimes be correct. I've had students come to my office hours and I'm like, well, I think it's a, you know, it's a dynamic environment. I think it's a static environment, you know, and we'll go back and forth, right? And I'll have a discussion with them. I'll say, well, on one hand, from this point of view, you're right, it is static. Oh, well, but if you look at it from this way, it's dynamic, okay? So it's just like with in software development, um, when you come up with your first plan, right? How you think you're gonna write this piece of software or whatever, and then you try it, and then you evaluate how it turned out. And if it worked good, awesome, you continue building on it. If the outcome wasn't good, then you go back and you revise it. Same thing here, right? I mean, software engineering, computer science, it's, it's, not, it's not an absolute perfect cut and dry thing. I mean, so, so many design decisions are based off of knowledge that you have that looks good at the time, but with more learning about the problem, you know, a clearer understanding of what you're trying to do, you realize that that initial decision wasn't a good one. You go back and you make changes. That's that's, that's normal. That's that's natural. You know, you're never going to know everything about everything all the time. Okay, so some examples here, and you might even be able to make some. You might look at this figure and go, you know, I think that an image analysis is really sequential, you know, or whatever. Um, but these are some ideas uh, and some examples. So. Um, Let's see here. So crossword puzzle, I'll just do one of them, right? You can read this on your own, but is that an, what type of environment is that? Is it observable? Is it fully observable? Is it unobservable? Well, yeah, it's fully observable because you can see the layout of the crossword puzzle. You see all the clues. There's nothing hidden from you there. How many agents? Is it a multi-agent environment or is it a single agent environment? Well, there's one agent trying to solve the crossword puzzle. Is it deterministic or stochastic? Well, it's deterministic because if I put a word here, if I decide to put a word here, there's no randomness that when I, from when I determine to make that word or put that word there that it's suddenly the characters are gonna change on me, right? There's no random chance that the word I decided to put in the boxes is gonna show up, right? That's deterministic. Um, it's sequential um, because, you know, the first word I put in maybe five across, okay? The next word that I put in that maybe is gonna be four down, it's gonna determine, or it's gonna, my decision's gonna be impacted by that first word, four across, right? So that's sequential. I have to take into consideration the previously played words or the previously written in words. Static, um, the environment doesn't change while I'm deciding which word to put there. Um, and discrete, right? So. Time is, is discrete. I mean, it, you can clearly differentiate the state of the crossword puzzle from one moment of time to the next, right? Either the word's in the boxes or it's not, right? There's no, there's no blurring of that, right? It's really, it's really easy to make the argument that it's a discrete environment. Okay, so for your homework assignment, you can you know, use this language, refer back to figure 2.6 for some examples. You're gonna tell me, is it a fully observable environment or not? Is it a single agent environment? Is it a multi-agent environment? You know, justify your reasoning. Think, 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 think. Too many times people think that computer science, no matter what subject you're studying, is somehow um, algorithmic. You know, like, um, like doing a puzzle or something, right? Where you have certain steps you just follow without thinking. No, 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 you have to reason. Right? You have to justify, you have to understand. Um, and I think you're gonna be surprised uh, in this course that there's gonna be further chapters where you have to reason, you have to think things through, okay? You have to use logic to understand it. So much depends on how the task environment is defined. I mean, how your agent behaves, whether it's rational or not, how you define the environment is gonna tell you what type of sensors, you know, how you're gonna write that agent function and so on. All right, so we're almost done here. Um, let's talk about the structure of agents. This is the last section. Um, so let's let's let me try to fly through this as much as possible. This is dragging it long enough as it is. Um, so artificial intelligence, right? The designer. It's your job to design an agent program that implements that agent function. Remember what that does. You're mapping percepts to actions. Percepts to actions. I perceive something in my environment. I take an action. My sensor sees something, I move my actuator to do something in response. That's what you're doing. That's the agent function. And the agent program is an implementation. You write the code to make that agent function 
uh, do its thing. Okay, you're writing code that says, I perceive this, now do this in response. Right? Okay, so that program is going to have to run on some kind of device, some kind of um, artifact, some kind of computing device that has sensors and actuators. Now, that computing device, is a term for that, it's the architecture. Now, that computing device could be a robot with legs and arms, okay, or it could be virtual. Okay, it could be a bot in a computer program where your sensor is just something that monitors an array and the actuators are just code that changes an element of that array. Okay, that could be the architecture. Or a self-driving car that's got radar, you know, or cameras and those cameras are hooked up to your agent program which then um, is hooked up to the actuators that say speed the car up by hitting the gas pedal or that can make the car slow down by activating the brakes. Okay, so the agent, here's another definition. An agent is its architecture plus the agent program. An agent is the architecture plus the program, okay? So we're focusing right now pretty much on, on this, okay? All right, so agent programs. The program takes a percept, that's your input for the program. Remember, all programs do three things, the input, process it, and then provide some kind of output. So the input is a percept and the output is um, an action that goes to the actuators, okay? So percept is input from the sensors, turns an action to the actuators, okay? All right, um, now, agent program, single percept becomes your input. You don't have any other information at that time, right? Now, um, an agent might need to make a choice based off of percept sequence. Remember, we we're talking about um, playing games, for example, or um, the crossword uh, puzzle, right? Based on what it's perceived. It's the, in the case of the crossword puzzles, what some of its percepts, the board, and what squares have been filled in. Okay. Now, sequence of those percepts. I saw four across. I saw ten down. I saw twelve across. Right? You have to be able to remember that sequence. So it has to be able to learn to a certain extent. Okay. All right, so we saw an example of a single agent function which is mapping percept sequences to action. It could be tabular, it could be a table, it could be something as simple as a table. You could think of a two-dimensional array, right? Um, where each column is a percept and an action. And then every single row, right? You got your percept is one column on that two-dimensional array, and then the next column is an action, and you have some kind of integer code or string or bit um, bit sequence, whatever um, that represents each of those things, which you would come up with when you're writing the code, okay? When you're designing it. So columns in your two-dimensional array, percept sequence, action. Each row is another entry. Right. So, figure two seven. You're gonna see stuff in the textbook that looks like this a lot. Okay. Now, keep in mind what this is. This is pseudocode, and at the end of the textbook, I can't remember the appendix number. If you go back, look in look in the table of contents. Go back in the appendix, and there is a description of how to read this pseudocode. Read it. Let me just stare at you creepily for a second. Read the appendix. You have to understand this pseudocode to understand the algorithms that we're going to be discussing and how to write some of the programs that you're going to be writing. Okay, textbook uses this type of pseudocode all over the place. Now, for the for the first few I don't know chapters or so, um, in the first few algorithms, I will go through and I will explain this. Okay, but towards the end, after I do it a couple times, I'm not explaining it anymore. Okay, I'm not going to hold your hand. You're going to need to be able to read this. And it's not hard to read. Okay? As a matter of fact, I'm also going to give you a link to a source code repository provided by the textbook publisher or, or the, the writers, the authors, I guess, where they have C Sharp, Lisp, Python implementations of all of this pseudocode. Use it to your heart's content for all of the programming assignments. It's totally fine. You have my explicit permission. You are not cheating. 
okay? Make your life as easy as possible. Matter of fact, if you look at the pseudocode and then you go take a look at their code repository, there's gonna be a light that, 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 that goes off in your head, right? It's just gonna boom, and you're gonna see it, and you're gonna go, oh, okay. Um, because you got a bridge from, I guess you could say the abstract here, into the concrete. And this tells you exactly what all the different components are, but not necessarily how to code them, because how you would actually code the, the uh, components is gonna depend on what you're trying to do. Right? based off of P's, based off of you know what you define as being rational. So what this textbook is doing, especially in this chapter, is saying at a high level, here are the things that you need to think about. Here are the components that go into it. But we're not telling you exactly how to code these components because that's gonna vary from situation to situation, okay? Um, so actually this video is, is dragging on uh, quite a bit. So I'll just go through maybe one or two more slides and then I'll put a cut in here. And then um, I'll come back and uh, do another video to finish off the chapter. This is taking longer than I wanted it to because I just don't know when to shut the hell up and I don't have a class in front of me to let me know, okay, let's get this going, right? So it's hard for you, it's hard for me. So, you know, let's get through this together. We can, we'll, we'll get through it together, okay? All right, so this is an example of an agent function, okay? Um, and so you would implement this, you would write the code for this, okay? But this is telling you what the pieces are. So when it says function, table-driven agent, if you go look in that source code repository, you'll find a written, an actual written function, you'll find some source code there, okay? Um, imagine how you might translate this into C++ or Python or whatever your favorite language is. So let's read this together, okay? So now remember what the agent function is. It's mapping a percept to an action so let's this is just the name of it so this is taking a percept as an input okay and the result of this function right it's mapping a percept okay it's mapping that percept i don't know if this if you can see this and then it's going to make some this kind of decision right and then an action is going to be generated right it's going to return an action that the agent should take and then that action would then be passed on by the agent to its actuators, okay? So percept mapped to action. So there's a function, percept comes in, action comes out, okay? So that's what this means. Percept is an argument, action gets returned. So what does persistent mean in their pseudocode? You can think of these as like global variables, okay? These are things that exist um, before this function is called, upon to generate an action and afterwards okay it's persistent this function might be called over and over and over again i mean because you can imagine that in, in, in that in vacuum world right that vacuum's moving all the time in its environment it's acting upon its environment there's the initial state right percept comes in okay you're in a okay um percept comes in it's dirty okay so what do we do we make a decision and then we return an action. What was the action? Suck. So the percept, A, dirty, right? Would come in as an argument. What comes out? Action, suck. Okay, so what's persistent? All of the percepts, right? So imagine a C++ vector or a Python list or a Java array list. And you just, you're, 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 you're adding to those containers some numeric value that represents some percept, right? Some code, whatever, a string. Maybe it's even a string literal, okay? But it's a sequence, it's a list, it's, it's a history of all of the percepts. Initially it's empty because when you first start with the agent, when you first fire up that vacuum cleaner, it hasn't perceived anything yet, right? So there's no history of it perceiving anything, okay? Now what else is persistent for a table-driven agent, an agent that makes decisions based off of a table? Well, the table, right? So remember when we had that table of actions, of actions and percept sequences for vacuum world. Okay, so that table has all of the actions and the actions are indexed by the percept sequences, right? You could think of um, dictionary in Python, right? Where each key is a percept sequence, right? And each action is a value in the dictionary. So you got your key value pairs. 
you have the sequence as the keys and then the actions as the values. That would be another way you can make a table. Okay, as a matter of fact, I'm telling you, look in the uh, source code repository and, um, you know, you'll see they have a Python implementation of this. Okay, and it says here, initially fully specified, right? Meaning that for every first subsequence, there's an action. You thought of everything, okay? So what is the first thing that this agent function does? It appends the percept to the end of percepts. So you give it a percept and says, oh, okay, 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 let me add that to my history. Let me add that to my sequence. Let me make a note that I saw that in addition to everything else that I've seen. Okay, then what? Then you do a lookup, that's what this is. You can think of this as a function that takes as its arguments, the sequence of percepts and the table. So those guys are those guys are persistent, right? So you're passing, you could say, you're writing a lookup function, right? That's a completely separate function where you pass it percepts and tables and then that lookup function just does lookup on the table given that percepts as a key, as an index, right? And then it just returns the action that's mapped to that. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. If, if, if not, give me, you know, give me a holler. But, you know, take the percept sequence, take the table, right? And then this function just does a lookup, right? Um, and then returns that action. Okay. Um, so you looked up the, the um, action you should take in the table given a certain percept sequence. Okay, once you have that, return the action, that's it. Okay, this is pretty much as simple as it gets. Okay, very, 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 very simple. Really, that's, that's, that's probably its, its best benefit is the fact that it's easy to understand. Okay, the problem is incredibly limited. Incredibly limited very very limited okay now for very simple environments for agents that aren't supposed to do a whole lot it could be sufficient right for the homework assignment it's, it's certainly sufficient okay but for anything where there's any level of complexity you can't possibly think of every possible percept sequence right so let's think about that self-driving taxi for a second right start the engine in the real world, as it's driving down the street, try to consider every possible thing in existence that could happen as it's driving down the street. So that way you could use them as the index in a table. No way, right? Think of everything that could possibly happen day to day in the world that that, count, that, that taxi might encounter even if you could think about that, right? Each one of the, all of those sequences, start the engine, drive down the street, avoid the, see the kid, um, avoid the kid, take, take a stock of where I'm at now, right? Perceive cop car, slow down, perceive that I've passed the pop, cop car. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just one of bazillions of combinations of things that can happen. So, can't be done. The table would be huge. You, might, you couldn't put enough memory, right? You couldn't get enough memory to store all of that table. You couldn't ever fill it out, right? If that, if that table is too big, if the amount of percept sequences that could possibly be generated, no way, okay? Um, there's, and the agent couldn't learn enough of those percept sequences. It's, just, it's too complex, okay? And the designer, you might not whoever's designing that table, you might not be able to figure out how to fill out that table anyway. Right? Think about 10 trillion different things you could perceive. What's the correct action for every one of those trillion sequences of, percep of, of, of percepts, right? It's just, it's crazy. Okay, they're very, very limited. So the challenge then, okay, in practical use, I mean, day-to-day -day AI, I mean, that's, it's, it's very limited. Right? There's very limited application of, of such agents. So the challenge is to be able to write agent programs that lead to an agent that is rational, okay? And those programs, that be, the, or excuse me, the behavior, 
right, has to come, has to spring up, has to originate from smaller programs, from more elegant programs, not huge tables. The tables isn't going to work. You're not going to have a table-based agent, right, driving a taxi. Not, nope, ain't happening, okay? So there's four approaches that we'll look at in part two, okay? We'll come back and we'll finish off in the second video, okay? So we're going to look at, we're going to introduce four new types of agents. Simple reflex agent, a model-based reflex agent, a goal-based agent, and a utility-based agent, okay? And the simple reflex agents, those are the easiest ones um, after the table-based uh, agent. And then each uh, one of these agents, as we go along, is going to add an additional layer of complexity or maybe a different take, right? So these different types of agents are going to have their different strengths, their different weakens, weaknesses, and they're going to have different components that you would have to implement, okay? Um, and so we'll talk about that. All right, anyway, so I'm going to put a cut in here, and um, you know, we'll see you in the next video.